right, Two Cities Church, are you ready for the Heights Conference? You might be saying, what is the Heights Conference? It's the first conference that we've ever had and hosted at our church. And you may ask, this, I'd ask this question if I were you. I would say, what is a church doing hosting a conference? Why are we hosting a conference? Because you need it, and I need it. Guys, I've seen God uniquely use conferences and camps and retreats in people's lives because your life is fairly, you hate to admit it to yourself, it's fairly average. It's fairly normal. It's kind of mundane. And what you need is moments and milestones and markers and mountaintop experiences. Guys, when we think about the Heights Conference, here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about a retreat that we're having at our church. Okay, I love retreats. And getting middle schoolers and high schoolers to go to a retreat is, well, fairly easy, and they go often. And getting college students to go to a retreat is basically kind of easy. And getting adults to go to a retreat is impossible. You have PTO and you've got kids and club sports and it costs money and it's really hard. So we just decided, you know what? Instead of bringing adults to a retreat, we're going to bring a retreat to adults. So you can sleep in your house and stay in your bed, okay? And you guys just come Friday night, Saturday, Sunday. Okay, this is going to be epic, Mark Clark and James Merritt, I've got some pictures of them. You guys can look them up. They're coming. Mark Clark, at one point, was leading the largest church in Canada, okay? America's hat. There it is, okay? He was leading the largest church in Canada, and um, he, he's written several books, The Problem of Jesus, The Problem of God. Uh, he's just got a heart for God's Word. He's hilarious. He's going to be launching us Friday night. Saturday, Dr. James Merritt from Atlanta, Georgia. Guys, you've never met a 72-year-old with this much energy. And he has a passion for personal evangelism in the next generation. And then, I'm sorry, but Sunday you're stuck with me, okay? So Sunday, uh, but I'm real excited about this because here, because guys, we've been, we've been coordinating this behind the scenes for a long time. Sunday, September 8th is going to be the most important day in the history of our church so far. And it's not because of my sermon. It's because of what we're going to launch that day that has to do with the future of our entire church. And I I am so thrilled. So mark your calendar. Guys, I try to tell you this. I don't know if you believe me or not. We do not create downloadable experiences. What happens in this room does not transfer online. And so if you can, let's be here Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday. We strategically put it at the end of the summer when all the vacations are done, but before the craziness of the fall. It's going to be the week after, the weekend after, Memorial Day, I mean Labor Day. So with that said, let's pray for this conference that I think is going to be catalytic, and then we've got a lot to cover this morning. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray right now that everybody in this room would make it a priority to be here. There's something that happens when we sacrifice to be here multiple nights in a row and we show up with a spirit of expectation. I pray we do what that video said. We would pray expectantly, we would worship boldly, and we'd have an encounter with you in your word. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Okay, so about a week and a half ago, I was in, maybe almost two weeks ago now, I was in Salt Lake City, Utah. Anyone been to Salt Lake City, Utah? A couple of us. Okay, it's far away, farther than you think. It's a four-hour flight, thankfully direct from Charlotte. But anyway, so I found myself in Salt Lake City, and I was just, my friend lives out there. So I get to Salt Lake City. He lives about 40 minutes outside, and I just said, I'm pro- you probably would feel the same way. I said, I got to see this city. Take me into the city. So he takes me into the city, and we get breakfast, and it's, it's so secular, and it's so pagan, okay, because all the California people move there during covid True story. And I was like, okay, look, tattoo parlor. Okay, yoga studio. Okay, bar, restaurant. Okay, got it, got it. Microbrewery, got it, cool. So I saw all that. And I'm, and I'm having breakfast at this cool place, okay? And, uh, and I'm talking. And then I said to my friend, I said, wait a second. And I had this thought on the plane, but I, I said to him, I said, Salt Lake City is the heart and home of Mormonism. I got to see the heart and home of Mormonism. He got all nervous. He said, Kyle, I cannot send you back to Two Cities Church if you convert to Mormonism. I said, I'm not converting. I got to see it, though. So, you know, our waiter comes back to the table, and I say to our waiter, young guy, I said, you know, hey, where is the Mormon headquarters? And he said, oh, man, it's about three blocks that way. 
So we pay the bill and we walk over there and we walk it's three, four, five blocks, doesn't take long. And I, I can't explain it to you. I don't even have pictures to show you. You gotta see it. The Mormons own like 10 or 15 acres in downtown. They have a, listen to this, they have a 21,000 seat. 21,000 seat auditorium. Okay, the Coliseum here holds 14,000, to put it in perspective. They have a library. They, anyway, the whole, you couldn't believe it. Everybody's dressed in blouses. Everyone has name tags on saying sister so-and-so. Why am I telling you this? Because I have never, and I don't think you ever will either, see two different religions that close to each other in the same place. I went into downtown Salt Lake City and I saw the religion of self-help. And I saw the religion of self-expression and I saw the, the religion of self-fulfillment. And then I walked five blocks and I'm in Mormon country. And I see the religion of good works and the religion of moralism. And here's the interesting thing, they don't like each other. The Mormons are like, oh, these liberals from California are ruining our city. And all the people from Salt Lake City are like, all these Mormons are holding us back. Well, today Paul has to address false ideas. And both secularism and Mormonism are false ideas. And both of them, by the way, have false teachers. Today Paul is going to, if you'll turn to type 2, 2 Corinthians 11, Paul's going to confront false ideas and false teachers. And here's the big idea if you take notes, okay? It's not wrong to tell people they're wrong, okay? In fact, sometimes it might be the most loving thing you can do. So Paul is going to get as direct as he does today, as he will throughout the whole letter, by talking to the false teachers, but he does it with the posture of a dad. Here, I'll show you this. Look at verse one. <clears throat> I wish you would bear with me a little foolishness. So Paul goes, guys, hold on a second. I gotta act like an idiot just for a few minutes here. And I don't really want to talk about myself, but I'm going to talk about myself. He says, do bear with me. Here it is, verse, verse 2. He talks about being a dad. Look here. For I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. So Paul likes to give kind of metaphors and illustrations. He goes, guys, okay, I'm writing to you. It's going to get pretty intense in a few minutes. But here's my posture. I'm a jealous dad. Now, let me clarify this, and you can see it in the text. He says, I'm jealous for you. I'm not jealous of you. If a dad is jealous of his kids, let's just call it what it is. It's weird. It's strange. It's going to lead to all kind of relational dynamics that shouldn't even exist. And that's on the outliers. That's not normal. Normally, dads and moms are jealous for their kids. This is how God is. You, ever, you read your Old Testament, you go, God says he's a jealous God. Do you think that means God wants your house? God's like, he's got a great house. Oh, man. Those tennis shoes, that car, that job. I'm so jealous. No. God is, it's so silly even to say it out loud. God's not jealous of you. God is jealous for you. Immature people are jealous of other people. Okay? Oh, why did they get to send their kids to that expensive private school in our city? Why, why every time I go on Instagram, they're on vacation! Why are they healthy and good-looking and appear to be happy when I'm miserable? Immature people, they're jealous of others. Mature people are jealous for others. So, and this actually helps, by the way, because when you're jealous for other people, you basically want more for them than they have, more of God, more of life, more of truth. This is why, and, and here, this is what I think. When you give feedback to people, the worst type of feedback is like, you're an idiot, please stop doing that, okay? Some version of that. That's not really, really helpful. And particularly with men, I mean, I don't think it works with women either, but with men, the best type of feedback, and I'll give you a little hack. This is a great little secret to know. The best way to give somebody feedback is to say some version of this. I know you're better than that. If you say that to a guy, he'll stand up straight with his shoulders back. Oh, okay, I am better than that. I'll work on it, right? Paul says that he's a jealous dad, and then he gives, you see the illustration in verse 2? It says that I betrothed you to Christ and to present you as a pure virgin. So he's using, I told you this, he's using the illustration of a dad. And back then, a dad had, dads have lots of roles, but with the daughter, as she got older, the dad had two basic responsibilities. Pick her husband, that's where Paul says, I betrothed you to Christ, and keep her pure for her wedding day. 
That was it. Now, I know, so this is going to be confusing to us in our modern sensibilities. Paul's talking about arranged marriages, right? And everybody's like, you know, uh, when you're a young man, you're like, arranged marriages are dumb. And when you're a dad with a daughter, you're like, they are so biblical. This is, <laughs> God knew what he was doing. Um, now, I know the question. Do we believe in arranged marriages here at Two City Church? Yes. And under every single person's seat right now, there's a number. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> We're just going to do a bunch of weddings to get this over. Okay. Um, no, so back then there was arranged marriage, and, and the, the, the father's role, and this is beautiful, is to make sure, hey, I know my daughter, I love my daughter, I want to make sure it's best for her. Uh, I know other men, and so he would choose a great suitor for her, and then he'd bring her together. So that's step one. And Paul goes, I did it, guys. I betrothed you to Christ. You're engaged. Because really, what, what happens? When Christ returns, there's the marriage feast of the Lamb, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we all get married. The church marries the, uh, Christ. So, but he says the second thing is, and this makes us really feel uncomfortable today, the job of the father was to oversee the sexual purity of the daughter until she got married. So much so that he was able to say to the future husband, she's not been with any other man and she is a virgin. Most dads, they're like, that makes me uncomfortable. I don't want to know what's going on. Don't ask, don't tell. That's not how the Bible works. And so Paul goes, I was really involved. I, I've introduced you to Christ, and here's the problem. The problem is uh, I feel a responsibility for you guys to be pure, and you're not being pure. So look what he says in verse 3. Here's what he says. But I am afraid, and Paul's not afraid of anything, but he's, I guess he's afraid of this. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve. Okay, full stop. Do you know the Bible never says that the serpent deceived Adam? In fact, it says the exact opposite. It says in 1 Timothy 2, Adam was not deceived. Now, I'm not saying men are not deceived. Obviously, they are, many times. In fact, I think Adam's sin was worse. He knew what he was doing, and he was passive and didn't care, which is men's struggle anyway, okay? But the whole point is God takes us back to the first temptation, the first deception. Look here. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, and that's the first thing we're told about Satan in the Bible is that he's crafty. Now we're told he's cunning that your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So he talks about how does deception happen which leads you away from Christ and leads you to be impure. Well, think about how, how did our first parents get deceived? It's the same way it happens to us. Number one, God's word is questioned. Did God really say? All deception first for the Christian questions the integrity of God's word, and therefore the goodness of the person of God. Secondly, deception makes false promises. When you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. Third, deception always denies any type of consequences, any type of discipline and any future punishment. You will not surely die so Paul writes, now deception is such a big deal, but here's the thing. How do you know, think about this with me for a second. How do you know when you're being deceived? You don't. <laughs> That's why it's called being deceived. You don't find out till later. Oh my goodness. Like if you're at the car dealership and some used car salesman, you feel like is lying to you about the price and lying to you about what he can give you for his car, he's not deceiving you. This is why deception is in betrayal too. They're so, they're, they're connected. They're so painful because you find out later. And then you see this whole, your whole past lens through a lens of deception. This is why what Christians need is spiritual discernment. John MacArthur, he's like 80 plus years old. Believe it or not, he's still pastoring in Southern California. And anyway, he knows the Christian church in America. And he said he thought in his 50-plus years of ministry experience, there's one major problem in the American church, lack of spiritual discernment. Now, what is discernment? Discernment, listen to this, is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. That's called common sense. Discernment is knowing the difference between right and almost right. It's being able to see the two millimeter shift. It's being able to see, wait a second, this is what he never talks about. This is what he always talks about. He's subtly adding something to God's word. He's subtly 
taking something away from God's word. Paul says what we need is to return to the simplicity. Look, look let me read it to you. I want you to see this. <clears throat> but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, here it is, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So listen, Christianity is not easy, but Christianity is simple. And one of the signs that you may be, someone may be teaching you the wrong things is it's complex. Here's what people do. Sometimes people want things to be complex so they don't have to obey the clear command. Well, actually, if you do the historical background and that word doesn't really mean that word, and people, I mean, the amount of mental and emotional and intellectual energy that goes into trying to make the Bible more sophisticated so that it can say the opposite of what it's clearly saying. So Paul says, here's the problem. Um, Christianity is simple, and they're trying to make it complex. Christianity is so simple that if you go out those doors and you go down that hall, there's a bunch of four-year-olds learning it today. That's how simple the gospel is. The gospel is so simple that you could say to a little junior four-year-old, you could say, do you know that God made you? Yeah, that makes sense. Do you know that you're a sinner? Do you ever do things that your parents don't want you to do and feel bad about? Yeah, okay, you're a sinner. Oh, I got that. Do you know that Jesus Christ loves you and died for you so that you wouldn't have to go to hell, but you can go to heaven? Do you know you can ask Jesus into your heart through repentance and faith, and you'll be headed to heaven with him? He'll take you home to heaven? And, and, and here's the thing. Pastor Dave and Pastor Caleb on our staff, okay? They both have told me before, they're 100% sure they, were, they became Christians, both of them at eight years old. The gospel is basic and bottomless, right? It's, it's simple, but... You know, I went to seminary at Southeastern, not too far from here. And when you go to seminary, what you see is there are guys there and gals there that they're working for like five years on a dissertation on the doctrine of sin and its connection with guilt. You're like, yep, these are really deep concepts. Somebody, you know, right down the hall is writing an entire doctrine of the transforming grace of God. So it's, it's simple, but deep as well. Well, Paul has to, look here, in verse 4, he gets a little bit upset. He says, for if someone comes and proclaims, by the way, everybody's preaching. Every blog is preaching. Every podcast is preaching. Every book is preaching. Every YouTube channel is preaching. For if someone comes and proclaims, okay, this is important, follow this, another Jesus, okay, than the one we proclaim, or if you receive a different spirit, from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel. Do you see that? Different Jesus, different gospel, different spirit. <clears throat> from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. So he tells us that false teachers are going to be known for telling us about a different Jesus, a different gospel, and, a, and having a different spirit. So let's talk about that. First of all, a different Jesus. Now, whenever I talk about, if I said to you guys, hey, listen, beware, there are going to be people, and they're going to be preaching a different Jesus. You're like, yep, Kyle, I know, you already talked about them. The Mormons... You know, they think that Jesus was Lucifer's brother. It's a false Jesus. Or you think, I know what you're talking about, Kyle. The Jehovah's Witnesses. It's like, I'm not really worried about you guys, you know, being influenced by the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses here in Winston. The false Jesus, the other Jesus that we're often, that the most common Jesus in our culture today is the Jesus of Protestant liberalism. It's the Jesus of the mainline churches in our city and all over. It's the Jesus where there's, he's only a human and he's not divine. So, like, okay, so you ever heard of the Jesus Seminar? You can Google this later. In the 1980s, these, you're not going to believe this. This sounds like a Babylon Bee article, what I'm about to tell you. In the 1980s, all these professors came together, and they were Protestant liberals, and uh, they were theologically liberal. And they basically said, guys, you're not going to believe this. They had four different color rocks. And they said, if Jesus, they read the Gospels, and they said, if Jesus definitely said it, this color rock. If Jesus definitely didn't say it, this color rock. If Jesus maybe said it, this color rock. If Jesus maybe didn't say it, or probably didn't say it, this color rock, okay? Well, afterwards, they cut and paste, and they, you know, and they said, okay, now we know. We spent a couple weeks together. We now know what Jesus actually said. And they put out a new version of the New Testament with just the words they think he really said. And one critic said, that's amazing because you know what the Jesus that you just told us about sounds like? You. 
Sounds like a 1985 liberal Protestant because that's what we do. We want to domesticate Jesus and make him in our image so we feel safer. God made us in his image, and we've been trying to say, uh, return the favor ever since. And so what, what, what happens here is, well, that's on one end. And then on the other end, I would say churches like ours, evangelical, Bible-believing, orthodox uh, churches, our tendency is sometimes to emphasize the divinity of Christ and not talk enough about the humanity of Christ. And how does that work? Well, think about this. What is, what was, what's was what been like basically the number one Christian selling book for like the last five years, or top, uh, up top, okay? Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland. You probably read it, or you heard of it. And you go, why is a book so famous among evangelical Christians called Gentle and Lowly? Because it's written by an orthodox, great Christian pastor guy who's writing about the humanity of Christ in a way that we haven't thought about it. So he says, there's a different Jesus, but then there's a different message. He says another gospel. Let me tell you how, I don't have time to get in this at great depth. <clears throat> Let me tell you how different, every message, so he says a different gospel, a different set of good news. Here's, how, here's what different gospels all have in common. They create a different hell, not the real hell, not the eternal conscious torment that the Bible talks about. They create a different heaven, not the heaven that we go to if we trust in Christ to be with Jesus forever, and they teach a different Savior that takes you from hell to heaven. Not Jesus in his life, death, and resurrection. So here's how it works. They say, let me tell you what hell is. Hell is being fat. And then they say, let me tell you what heaven is. Heaven is being fit. And then they say, and then let me tell you what your Savior is. Crossfit and kale, and you will have what you need. And then watch people, it is funny, but watch people worship CrossFit and Kale. They will worship what they think is going to take them out of hell and into heaven. You ever see a guy or girl and they're single and they've been single for a long time and unmarried and old is hell <coughs> and married is heaven and you go, it's kind of weird how much he likes this girl. It's kind of strange how obsessed she is with him because you need to grab theological language. This is not her boyfriend. This is her savior who's taking her out of singleness hell. There, and I don't have time, you know it. You just plug in, go plug in your functional heaven, go plug in your functional hell, and then guess what, you'll find your functional savior. But I wanna talk about something even more important in my opinion for this moment, and it's that we have a different spirit. Do you see that? Here's what he's, it makes sense, okay? This is the uniquely Christian worldview that we bring from the scriptures. It's not just that there are different Jesuses talked about and there are different messages preached. We're told there's a different spirit behind all of it. So think about that. Here's what, here's what Paul's telling us. There is a spirit behind all teaching. So hopefully, if I'm up here, whoever's up here, and we're teaching the Bible and we're teaching the gospel and we're teaching the truth of God's word, behind that should be a spirit. And the spirit behind that, you know his name, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the ultimate preacher at Two City Church. He takes God's word and he applies it to people's hearts. And he's the one who inspired and illuminates all scripture, okay? Paul's saying there's something else. There are other spirits, and I don't have time to get into all of them. There are other spirits that are behind other teaching. Have you ever wondered, like, why does all of this same toxic teaching show up all over the world at the same time? Even before there was easy use of internet and technology and social media, like why does the same thing show up in Germany that shows up in the USSR, that shows up in China? You're like, that's kind of strange. Across different languages, we have this, it's because it's a spirit. And you'll notice the spirit will have a similar rhetoric. I'll, I'll tell you, so, so behind climate change or global warming, I'm not here to debate, you know, are the glaciers melting and, you know, what are all the effects of climate change and, and what should we do about it? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the spirit behind so many people who talk about climate change. They talk about the importance of the planet over the people on it. I, want to, I just want you to know, 100%, that is an anti-human, demonic spirit. If you ever hear someone say, there's too many people on the planet, it's like, that is the demonic spirit. That's a, you want less of the image of God on the planet, right? Or you ever meet some couple, you ever meet this couple, 
They're like 24 years old. They're married. Well, we just, we can never bring children into this world. It's like that. You could never obey the first command of Scripture to be fruitful and multiply. How about, how about the culture of death with all of its rhetoric, right? It's, you know, you, you see it it's everywhere. It's the same my body, my choice, women's health care, reproductive rights. It's a culture of death that wants to kill innocent children in the womb. Or is that says, Grandpa, you're 82 and you're kind of old. And you're kind of a burden on our family. And do you, what are your thoughts on assisted suicide or euthanasia? Or what about the gender? We're so compassionate for anyone who struggles with gender dysphoria and stuff, but I'm saying that the, the movement behind the gender ideology, transgender movement, listen, is a movement that wants to cut up human bodies. Don't overlook this. So that they cannot reproduce. And so Paul says, guys, I'm kind of worried about the message. I'm more worried about the spirit that is behind this message. That's why you, some messages, they just have such power and they possess people. Well, here's what Paul's going to say. Look here. He's going to say this. For if someone comes, I'm in verse 4 again, and proclaims another Jesus than the one you proclaimed, and if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, and if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, here it is. Paul goes, it's your fault. Look here. You put up with it readily enough. Here's another pre er, principle from Scripture. People get the leaders and teachers they deserve. And you think about how many people in our city and around our nation, they go to church every week and they get suited and booted to go to church to look all nice. And they sit in church while false doctrine is being taught. But they're more concerned about what they're doing this afternoon, what time their tea time is, where they're going to, to lunch. Completely unaware of how toxic everything is and how it's affecting their children. So their children see no power in the church. They see Christianity as fake, and they resent their parents for even taking them to something that's that silly and that goofy. And Paul says, you put up with it, shame on you. But then, he, look what he says in verse 5. Indeed, I consider that I'm not at least inferior to these super apostles. In the Greek, it's, it's, it literally is like super duper apostles. He's making fun of them, okay? There are these guys that are coming in, and Paul goes, I'm not, by the way, isn't this amazing? The early church, this blows your mind. The early church didn't respect the apostle Paul. I mean, if I died tonight, I, the, most, the person I'd be most excited about talking to in heaven would be Jesus. The second would be the Apostle Paul. He's incredible. The life he lived, the things he did. Here's actually another principle you just need to know. and just It's a principle of humility that, you'll, that you can carry with you. We don't often respect the greatest and most godly people of our own generation. I mean, if you're a student of history, you know this. Everyone's like, well, while some guy's president, he was a horrible president. And then 75 years later, they write a book like he was an incredible president. It's like, yeah, we couldn't see it in the moment. Paul is not respected by these people. So in verse six, let me show you what he has to do. He says, even if I'm unskilled in speaking, I'm not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we've made this plain to you in all things. So Paul goes, guys, I'm, look, I'm not a really good speaker. He's told you that before. He says, now, he says, let me just tell you this. I do know what I'm talking about. I do know the truth. And, and I try to make the main things the plain things and the plain things the main things. That's a huge value here, right? We teach whole Bible to make whole Christian. We teach the whole Bible. But what we try to say is, hey, we're going to make the main things the plain things and the plain things the main things because part of the way that churches get weird and pastors get goofy and the way churches become unintentionally become false teachers is they just start emphasizing all of this secondary and tertiary stuff. I saw a church one day get really weird, this was years ago, really weird on how to spend your Lord's Day. And they started talking all the time about the Lord's Day and how, what you could do and what you shouldn't do on the Lord's Day. I've seen churches do this with end time stuff. I've seen churches get strange about baptism. I've seen it happen. I've seen churches get really weird about spiritual gifts. It's all the same. It's the same playbook. If you don't get it, 
Take something that's important, but not that important, and overemphasize it all the time. Get weird about it. That's what happens. So Paul says, guys, I make the main things, the plain things, the plain things, the main things. It's about Jesus. It's about God's truthful word. It's about heaven and hell. It's about sin and repentance. It's about discipleship and mission. And that's all I'm going to talk about. That's, that's what Paul says. But then in verse 7, he moves, if you take notes, he moves from saying I'm a jealous dad to saying I'm a generous dad. Look here. <clears throat> or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because, look at this, I preach God's gospel to you free of charge. What a statement. He said, in fact, I had to rob other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. So Paul's like, I didn't, Paul brings this up all the time. He goes, guys, I didn't, I didn't want money to be a stumbling block, so I never even asked for an offering. And Paul, Paul tells us something we didn't know earlier. Look here, verse 9. And when I was with you and I was in need, so Paul goes, I didn't tell you this, but there's a couple times I was with you and my AC broke. And my car broke down. And I needed new clothes and I, and I didn't have enough money for groceries. And I'll tell you this now, but I never told you guys when I was in need. I did not burden anyone for the brothers who, who came from Macedonia supplied my needs. So I refrained and I will refrain from burdening, burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. Okay, let me just explain this really quickly. Here's what happened. <laughs> Paul did not charge for his services, so they didn't think his services were valuable. The other guys would come in and they would charge. All right, if you're going to hear me speak, it's going to cost 50 bucks. Or at the very end, I'm going to pass an offering. Or I'm going to tell you how much money we need to raise. And Paul never talked about money. And he never asked for money for his services, so they didn't think his services were valuable, right? This is something every business has to figure out, right? Say you're going to try to compete with Lululemon and Viore, these two brands. Well, then you got to go, well, what, how quality of a shirt should we make? And what's the price point so that people don't think that they're getting ripped off? But if we make it too cheap, even if it's the same quality as Lululemon, people won't want to buy it because they won't think it's nice because it doesn't cost enough. This is the tension. Paul goes, guys, he's like, can I teach you economics 101? He says, Guys, you're confusing price and value. Price is what you pay for something. Value is what you actually get by getting it. And Paul goes, guys, the price was zero, but the value was eternal. So Paul goes on because he has to talk about this. Look here. <laughs> he says this, verse 12. And what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim that those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. Real quick, Paul's just saying, guys, this is, sometimes you might not be able to tell the difference between me and the false teachers when you first look at us, but here's going to be the main thing. They take a lot of money. It's all about money for them. It's not all about money for me. And because it's all about money for them, what they're going to do is they're going to tell you whatever you need to hear, whatever you want to hear, whatever tickles your ears so that you'll stay and give more money. Paul goes, I don't do that. Look at verse 13. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen. He tells us, that, by the way, that's the first time he calls them directly false apostles. He says, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants also, words used again, disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, their end will correspond to their deeds. So he's telling us something else about false teachers that we need to know. Okay, and here's what it is. False teachers don't look like you would think. The, the, the language of a disguise. I know all of us think, if I saw a false teacher, oh my God, I would know. First, they'd be dressed in all black, obviously. You know, and if you look real close, you'll be able to see the horns coming out of the back of their head and you'll just know they're a false teacher. It's like, no, they usually smile. They're normally very funny. They normally ask a lot of questions. They normally have a big following. What is a false teacher? Let me just bring it down because I know, I know, you know, I know what you're thinking. Kyle, just tell us the five podcasts we shouldn't be listening to. Just call them out. It's like, no, 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 that's not what we're trying to do. A false teacher, I want to give you a more elastic definition. A false teacher is anybody who consistently tells you things that aren't true. I mean, maybe some know what they're doing and they're lying to you, but, but by the Bible's definition... A false teacher is just somebody who consistently tells you things that aren't true. 
That could be a professor. That could be a pastor. That could be a politician. For some of you, <laughs> the biggest false teachers in your life, are you ready for this? Are your friends. So why having good friends is so important because your friends can be these false teachers and they're all over social media and they're lying to you all the time. So how does this work? Like, okay, let me talk about something else that I think has to do. Like, where is false teaching? Because remember, the spirit of deception and the spirit of false teaching is at first to ask you a question to undermine what you believe. That was what happened with Eve and Adam in the garden. Where is this happening today? Okay. And where is it particularly happening with young people? Well, don't worry, I'm not going to do this every week. But I'm going to tell you about another book I read, okay? Um, I'm going to show you this book, guys. Bad Therapy. Okay? I think someone told me, don't hold me this, there was a season where Amazon wouldn't sell this book. It's like, I need that book then. A book Amazon doesn't want to sell is a book I need to buy and own. Bad Therapy, Why Kids Aren't Growing Up. They do now sell this on Amazon. You can take it down. Abigail Schreier is a mom and very well-educated and uh, a secular Jewish woman. And basically, she talks about, she has, her book's not called False Teachers, but she's talking about all of the lies that are being told to the younger generation, particularly in the school system. And by the way, I told you this before, I can't put an airbag around everything. I know there's a lot of great people in the school system. The school systems can do a lot of good and all that. I, Airbag, end of parenthesis, okay? But she is talking here. Okay, I'll tell you the story she tells. She starts the book out, and she says her son, who's 12, gets back from camp, summer camp for two weeks. He has a stomach ache. She says, sleep it off. He next day wakes up, next day wakes up. He still has it. She says, okay, fine, let's go, let's go to the PZD doctor. Let's just do it. So they go down to the ER or the ED, whatever you call it, and uh, and. They rule out, she, they get in there, they rule out appendicitis, oh, thank goodness, you know. And they're, he's healthy, clean bill, they give him a little something, I don't know, and, and, and they're about to leave. Remember, he went in because he had stomach problems. And this is in California, not North Carolina. I know some of you are medical professionals, you'll know more about this than me, but she said, they're about to leave, and another guy in scrubs walks into the room and says, I'd like to talk to you alone. And she thought, oh, okay, great. No, your son. Thought, oh, her mama bear, spidey sense came up, and she was like, oh, guy with a clipboard. What's going on here? So she grabs, well, I think she asks, she says, well, can I see the clipboard? She flips over. There's five questions that this man wanted to ask this boy while he was alone with him. I put them on the screen. She puts them, she prints them exactly in the order and exactly as they were. By the way, this is from the National Institute of Health. Question number one, in the past few weeks, have you wished you were dead? Question number two, in the past few weeks, have you felt that you or your family would be better off if you were dead? Question three, I can't believe this. In the past week, have you had thoughts of killing yourself? Have you ever tried to kill yourself? Question four, if yes, how and when? Five, are you having thoughts of killing yourself right now? If yes, please subscribe. Guys, this book is littered with how this is happening all over. The school system would be one of the main places it's happening. Anywhere you're dropping your kids off and don't know really who's in charge and what kind of, and it's happening mostly through questionnaires and surveys. Go read the book. There's other questions. Uh, are you happy with your parents? Do you think your dad overworks? Do you ever wish you didn't live at home? Oh, there's a bunch of these for gender stuff. All of them. Oh, yeah. Have you ever thought about being a boy if you're a girl? Have you ever felt ugly as a girl? It's like, what girl hasn't felt ugly? These are questions that are serpent-like. So here's what Paul says. Paul says we have to talk about false teaching, okay? I don't, like, get excited talking talk about this. We have to talk about false teaching because the Bible says you're supposed to avoid it. And how can you avoid something that you don't know exists and we never talk about? So we have to talk about it. Number two, Paul says that we are to call out false teachers and rebuke them publicly. And I know what you're thinking. You go do that, Kyle. Uh, but 
I don't want to talk about what I need to do. Obviously, I need to do that. I'm trying to do that. This sermon is, I mean, in fact, the Apostle Paul in six different places names names. Names. Like, don't ever listen to this guy again. Okay, but here's how I think you need to call people out. And be wise and winsome. Think about this, guys. Some of you need to get way more involved at the local level. Like, you need to get way more involved in your school board. And I know we're in the Bible Belt, and it's Winston-Salem, and we're kind of a small city. It's like, no, no, no. All that's over now. You're going to have to get a lot more invested and involved, and you're going to have to speak up and say this goofy stuff that you are putting in the libraries or that you are teaching the sex ed stuff or that you are hiding. Stop it. And if you want some encouragement, here's what you do. You go home right after this. Even when you get in the car, you pull your phone out, and you Google Rosaria Butterfield. Rosaria Butterfield is a former lesbian who became a Christian and now is a mom of four. And she's like, I don't even know. She's got to be like in her 50s. And she's got to be like five, six, 85 pounds soaking wet, okay? And she, you want steel in your spine. You go watch her talk to the Durham County School Board. It's recorded. And you'll be like, I've never seen someone with that much conviction and clarity come at one thing. Some of you are going to, you're going to, you don't get braver when you get safer. Some of you, I just, I promise you that. Some of you go, well, when I get this position at work and when we don't have to pay for this anymore and when our kid, it doesn't work that way. You're going to have to speak up when your HR department is making you feel sick and weak. It's like, how much longer are you going to put up with all this stuff? Now get your CV together. And have a group and think it through and talk to the elders of our church and we'll help you. We can't put up with this anymore. You have to stand up for these things. And part of what we're trying to do here is equip each other so that we can do it. Okay, now Paul moves on. He says, I'm done talking about all that. He says, now, he says this, verse 16. If you're following along, Paul says, I'm like a dad, I'm jealous for you. Like a dad, I'm generous toward you. And finally, like a dad, I'm willing to suffer for you. Look here, I repeat, let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, accept me as a fool so that I too may boast a little. What I'm saying with this boastful confidence, I say not as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. Again, Paul's like, I don't want to boast, but here I go. For you gladly bear with fools being wise yourselves. For if you bear, for you bear it, if someone makes you slaves or devours you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or strikes you in the face. So Paul basically says, here's what, here's what false teachers do. They purposely um, take advantage of you and then they make you more dependent on them. And then he says this. He says, look, look at what he says at the end of verse 20. You need to see this. You know, he says, takes advantage of you or puts on airs or strikes you in the face. This is so important to see what he does in verse 21, and this will explain a little bit of my preaching ministry. I want to show you this. Verse 21. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. So what did Paul say? Hey, guys, when false teachers come, they punch you in the face. Sorry I was too weak to do that. What is Paul saying? He's using sanctified sarcasm. You, when you deal with religious people, you have to make fun of them. Religious people, by the way, if you ever, and some of you are religious. Like, I don't like how that sounds. Religious people have no sense of humor. And when you're dealing with somebody who's religious, you, have to, you do a couple things. You pray for them, you, you winsomely talk to them, you rationalize with them, and if none of that works, you make fun of them. To, to their faith, so they understand how goofy everything that they're doing is. That's why I use the word goofy and weird and strange and silly a lot, because all of it's true. And this is so important to understand. Guys, Jesus did this. You have a log in your eye. Everybody else has a speck. That's funny. (laughs) Unless you're religious, then you don't get it. You're like, I don't get it, I don't get it. When Jesus confronts the Pharisees and says, you guys are so committed, you tithe cumin and dill. He's like, you tithe out of your spice rack. He's making fun of them. When Elijah is fighting against the idols and they're saying, he's saying, where is your God? To the idol gods. He says, is he on the toilet? Okay, you get it. So this is important. <clears throat> Paul basically, he, but now Paul goes, look here. This is important. Verse 21, he says this. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I'm speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So Paul starts with his pedigree. 
So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Look at this. I love this. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. And then Paul, Paul's like, I, I'm talking like a bad man. Paul's like, I'm taking crazy pills. That's what I feel like. Look here. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, and countless beatings, often near death. You know how many times Paul went to prison? Clement, who wrote, I think, in the late first century, early second century, he's, he's the best kind of historian we have on this. He put it together. He says, the best I can tell from Scripture and, and other people's stories, Paul serves seven prison, prison sentences. What, he, what Paul doesn't know when he writes this is, Paul, you're going to prison two more times. They're going to put you in prison in Jerusalem. They're going to put you in prison in Rome. Look here. He says this. Five times, I'm in verse 24, five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes minus one. So the Jews hit you with whips. They gave you lashes. He says this, three times I was beat with rods. The Gentiles hit you with rods. Paul's like, everybody's against me. The religious and the rebellious both beat me up everywhere I go. And then he says this, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Look here, verse 25. Three times I was shipwrecked. Okay, Acts 27, Acts chapter 27 talks about one of those shipwrecks. It didn't happen yet. So the next time you read Acts 27, that's his fourth shipwreck. It's like Paul. He says, look, a night and a day I was adrift at sea. It's like something out of the Titanic. He's holding on to something and drifting in the middle of the night. So here's what Paul's doing. <laughs> this is so important. Paul is saying the mark of true ministry is suffering. Paul's doing something that you've seen done in movies. Okay, you ever watch, gee, I know you guys love these movies. You ever watch like Jason Bourne? You ever, yeah. You ever watch like, uh, you know, you, you watch James Bond, you watch Rambo, you watch, uh, they all have the same kind of moment that happens, right? There's like some really good looking, really strong, you know, male lead, and he's kind of got a, a history that you can't fully put together. And then there's always that scene about a quarter in to about halfway in the movie. Remember what happens? He takes his shirt off. And I don't mean the front of his shirt. I mean what people need to see is they need to see his back. This happens all the time. Jason Bourne takes his shirt off. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. There's scars everywhere. And as soon as you see it in a movie, it has that effect. The music changed, and you realize, this guy has done a lot more than I thought. He's been through a lot more than I thought. Basically, Paul says, don't make me take my shirt off. He says, I'm going to do it, though. i got to show you my scars. In fact, Paul describes his missionary journeys. Look here. Verse 26, on frequent journeys. <clears throat> this is Paul describing his four missionary journeys that are in the back of your Bible. Most Bibles are on maps. He says this, the controlling word used eight times is danger. Look at this. In danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. Paul says everywhere I go, there's danger which basically means danger means I'm open to the potential of hurt or harm toward me, both physically or emotionally. He says this, in toil and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Paul basically says, guys, this is the mark of my ministry. Do you remember in the book of Galatians? Book of Galatians, Paul writes about, against circumcision, how you don't need to be circumcised to be a Christian. And at the very end of the book of Galatians, Paul signs the letter, I bear on my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. What's he talking about? Suffering. What's he saying? The sign of being a Christian is not circumcision, but suffering. In fact, Paul ends, I'll just show you this, Paul ends with his greatest suffering mentioned in verse 28. You read all that suffering, you go, Paul, that was a lot. Paul goes, Not, well, here he says this, and apart from all other things, some think this should be translated above all other things. And on top of it all, basically, the most, the most pressing and painful thing, he says this, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. So Paul ends with the internal, relational, constant suffering he goes through. Who is weak and I'm not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? Here's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, <laughs> he says, who... Paul had this ability to go and plant and pastor a church and travel all around and have all these different churches and have all these crowds and then go, but guys, I want you to know that every time I get the phone call that somebody's marriage is falling apart, I'm brokenhearted and I'm over at their house trying to figure it out. 
As soon as someone tells me, you know, yeah, I know I'm hard on these different things, but, but as, soon as, as soon as someone tells me they've got a prodigal son or daughter, I'm at their house praying with them that night. As soon as someone tells me that it's been hard on them financially, I'm trying to raise money for them. I'm trying to find some money for them. As soon as someone tells me they got to go over to, to the hospital, they're sick or they need surgery, I'm showing up and I'm praying. But Paul's like, guys, I'm all in. Paul says, and I, and I give this to you, Two City Church, as we close. Paul says, you want to know what a true Christian looks like. You want to know what the true credentials for ministry is. He goes, it's not a seminary degree. It's not skills, competence, money, network. He said, it's two things, a broken body and a broken heart. Right? There's no way to raise kids without it having an enormous effect on your body, on your sleep, and on everything else. Paul goes, that's how it is. Paul says, I have a broken heart, or I have a broken body, but I also have a broken heart. What I wanna do is, if you'll close your eyes and bow your heads, I wanna ask God to, to make us brave, that we might speak and be willing to suffer like the Apostle Paul was. That we, we if we're honest, most of us could use a little danger in our lives. Our lives are not dangerous, they're domesticated. We're not dangerous, we're docile. And we, we just want to be brave and courageous like the Lord Jesus was, like the Apostle Paul was, Lord. Would you strengthen families? There are people in here who have to have conversations, Lord, with family members or friends or coworkers or classmates, Lord. Would you make us a church that actively loves the truth? We have a relationship with the truth. We wanna teach the truth, we wanna speak the truth, and we're willing to walk through the consequences of doing that. Lord, would you give us the same heart for our church in our city that the Apostle Paul had for churches and cities? We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.